start by reading a bit of an email, uh, partly because my battery is running out, but partly because I think we should feel a little bit outraged when we have a discussion like this, rather than just defeated by perpetual inequality. And this is an email from the 25th of June this year from one of the people who work at Section 27 who are doing some research into what's happening in the Eastern Cape with the, health, with the collapse of health services. Just interviewed a saintly woman who lost her child and went into Nelson Mandela Academic Hospital to have the fetus removed. They didn't give her any pain medication. The child came out feet first. She wandered the halls looking for a nurse to give pain medication whilst the legs of her dead child hung from her. There was no electricity. Nurses were delivering other babies by light of cell phones. Expecting mothers shared beds, no blankets. She had her husband bring her some borrowed from a friend in town. When they finally got in to remove the baby, someone stole the cell phone. Uh, that's, you know a month and a half ago. And yes, there are extreme stories of indignity from our health system, but they're not rare. And underneath an extreme story like that is a much more common story of daily indignity, daily service failure, daily suffering at the hands of a health system that is meant to heal and to, to repair people. Um, and I think that has to be the backdrop to what we can achieve or what, what we can't achieve. Now, I just want to make a couple of preliminary comments. You know, uh, Axel and Fazila said that you know, part of the origins of this discussion comes from thinking about why it's necessary to persuade the middle class in South Africa that NHI is in their, their, their interests, the people who currently know that they're being ripped off, but think that at least they're getting reasonable medical care, even though they're paying excessively for it. And I think that's an important question. But I think in some ways, it's the wrong question, with respect. Because I think that the political determinant of whether NHI ever comes into being is persuading poor people that they have a right to health care in this country and that the most efficient way to deliver on that right is through, a, is through a national health system, whatever we call it. Because I would argue, and I'll come to what Louis said just now, that the truth of the matter is that there will be no NHI, there will be no national health system in South Africa if there is not a movement for a national health system. And at the moment, there is not a movement for a national health system. There is not a health movement. There are bits and pieces. There's TAC and the People's Health Movement and bits of the trade unions and so on. But there is not a unified movement for, for justice in, in health. And Robbie, I'm not misrepresenting what you say because it goes to what Louis said, is that the issue is, yes, there's a contest of ideas going on. But also, as Louis said, there is a contest of interests, of vested interests going on around national health insurance. And that is the reason for the delay. I mean, I'm an absentee member of the Ministerial Advisory on National Health Insurance because it was just a waste of time for a long time. It's one of those committees that didn't do anything and didn't go anywhere. Uh, pardon that this is being recorded, but to tell you the truth. Um, um, but, you know, but I do know that there has been a, co a contest in government over NHI, in particular between the Treasury and the Ministry of Health about how NHI should be funded and whether there, sh there should be co-payments as a, as, a, as a part of uh, access to healthcare services. And also, there is a contest of vested interests, and I'll say a little bit more about the private healthcare sector in, in, in a minute, because as we've seen already, private healthcare is very good business in this country. And nobody's proposing to do away 
with the private healthcare sector. And personally, I don't think that it's feasible or that we should, we should even talk about it. Nobody's actually proposing to do away with the medical aid schemes necessarily. But an efficiently, properly instituted system of national health insurance would make those things redundant and would, would give cause for them to wither away. And that is, that is what they understand. So again, you know, I, people leak me lots of documents. <laughs> so I've seen what Netcare is saying. I've seen what MediClinic is saying. All of them are lawyered up. All of them are, they've made their submissions on the green paper. The submissions on the green paper have veiled loyally in between the lines hints of litigation. If uh, the NHI system is not the type of NHI system that they will be satisfied with. And that partially explains, I believe, the delay that we have between the green paper and the white paper. But one of the things I do want to say in this presentation, though, is that I think it's very important that we give credit to the Ministry of Health for some of the public health sector reforms that are being implemented and for the approach that is being taken to, to national health insurance. And I'll, I'll, I'll so, so, but let me now just get to the, what I wanted to say. Uh, as Fazila said, I, I, my feeling is that the starting point for discussion about NHI and whether it can be achieved is this fact that in South Africa, health is not a commodity. Our supreme law says that everyone has a right of access to healthcare services. That says that, that the government has a duty to decommodify health and not allow people who think that health is something that can be made, lots of money made from, to, to determine the framework for health. It's also significant that the Constitution says that no one may be denied emergency medical services. And, and the question of what constitutes emergency medical services is a crucial, unanswered question still in NHI, because nearly 20 years post-Constitution, there is not a legal definition of what is meant by these three words, emergency medical services. And because there's no legal definition of emergency medical services, nobody can claim that right at the moment. And that would be a critical aspect of NHI. But in the same part of the Constitution, Section 27, that says this, the actions of the state in trying to put in place a national health system are, are both mandated and justified. Because Section 27 says the state must take reasonable legislative and other measures within its available resources to progressively realize the right of access to healthcare services. And put simply, what that means when an NHI idea comes under attack from the private healthcare sector <laughs> is that the government, when it puts a policy proposal on the table, when it seeks to limit certain powers in order to improve the right of access to healthcare services, is simply doing what the Constitution requires of it, which is moving in a direction of delivering quality health care for everyone. But 20 years after 1994, as I showed you with that email and as we've seen with the slides, uh, the Constitution seems very, very far from the reality. And what we have witnessed is not just the growth of inequality, which has grown significantly, but is actually the deterioration of health outcomes in many respects and the deterioration of certain healthcare services. There is more access to healthcare than there was 20 years ago. But the quality of public healthcare has degenerated in, in many respects. And I would argue that as we approach NHI, there are two overriding issues now that have to be addressed. The first thing is the quality of public healthcare services. Uh, as I mentioned, Eastern Cape health system has collapsed. It has literally, Costa will agree, medicines are not getting to clinics, people are not being paid, uh, machines, equipment are not in the system, there's a bloated bureaucracy and a starved uh, service delivery platform. 
but I won't go on about the quality of healthcare service, public health care service, but that's part one. The second part, which is not unrelated, is the cost and oversupply of, the, of private health care uh, in this country. And the two work against each other. It hasn't been mentioned yet today, for example, but you know, bad public health is good private business. And there are three major sources of expenditure in health in the country. There's what government spends through tax, there's what the private healthcare sector user spends through medical aid schemes, and then there's what we call out-of-pocket expenditure, which is generally expenditure not by middle-class people, but by the poorest of the poor who spend money because the public system can't deliver them their health care. And on an annualized basis, the last figures that I saw said that over 20 billion rand per annum is spent out of pocket on health care. 20 billion rand per annum is spent out of pocket on expensive private health care services. And as we've seen, the other problem with the growth of the private health care se sector, the unregulated, uncontrolled growth, is that even those people who think that they are purchasing some sort of security through medical aid schemes discover that they're not. And as I was preparing for this presentation yesterday, I, I discovered something that I'd never heard of before. I'm sure probably many of you have heard about it, but is the, is the, the error of what are called gap plans. Uh, I don't know if people know about gap plans, but gap plan is the insurance that you take out above your medical insurance for costs that you may incur when your medical insurance has run out. Those are called gap plans. And in the last five years, there has been a five-fold increase in the number of gap plans that people can buy. And there are today 250,000 different gap plan policies that are in existence to help you top up on your top up. There are also hospital plans, there are also top-up plans, and, and so on. And, as I said, the result of this is a it, it, it's caused by a deteriorating public health care system, but it, 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 it feeds inequality and it feeds the private health care system. Some of the strongest opponents of national health, care, health insurance will be hospital groups like Netcare, like Mediclinic, and so on. Netcare's return on capital employed in its hospitals has risen to 25% by 2011, from about 7% 10 years ago. Mediclinic's return on capital employed has risen to 27.3%. And I think, you know, one of the things, Fazila mentioned it, that, that we have to get across to middle class people and to people who use the private healthcare sector is that private health is for the most part not world class. You know, you can't equate hospital care, I mean hotel care, <coughs> with health care. The fact that you, you get a nice reception and there's flowers and, and nice bedrooms and so on doesn't mean that the health care is good. In fact, there hasn't been enough research and analysis into the private healthcare system, but you would find that in many instances the healthcare is bad. And I can tell you, and I can't name names unfortunately, but two very prominent people who I have know and who have died quite recently, both died as a result of hospital acquired infections in the private healthcare sector, uh, what's called nosocomial in infections. Um, um, and that is a big problem within the private healthcare sector, as is the problem of over-servicing uh, uh, people. We were talking about it last night. You know, you need one blood test, but you get given 25 blood tests and the, the price increases massively, etc. So, so, the bottom line is that we need what we would call in, our, in, in the AIDS field combina a combination therapy approach to national health insurance. You need to hit the different points of the problem at the same time. Uh, you need to hit the private sector to the extent that the private sector is unregulated, has uncontrolled spiral in costs, etc. And you need to hit the public health care sector to the extent that the deterioration in the public health care sector, I'm nearly done, it contributes to the, to the growth of inequalities. The vicious circle that, that we have, I describe like this. 
Deteriorating public health care has led to growing demand for private health care, which is being provided to more and more people at a poorer and poorer quality. That's the strange set of, of, of contradictions that we're dealing with. So, you know, what is the, is, is the way forward? Um, I would argue that, that although not doing it fast enough, uh, the basic approach certainly of the Minister of Health is the correct one at the moment. Um, you know, he is instituting a number of public sector reforms uh, which are very important to lay the foundation for, for, for an NHI system because you can't, you can't have a big bang approach to NHI, much as we would like the inequalities to be removed tomorrow. You've actually got to stabilize the system. You've got to improve the platform, the public platform. <coughs> you know, David has mentioned the NHI pilots. You know, people should read the full document that David gave reference to. It's, it's a tragedy that there are these 11 pilot districts. And although the consultants who've written the report have put a gloss on it, the reality is that it's a disaster. What we're seeing is a disaster. But the good thing is that I think, it, for the first time, attention is being paid to the quality of care in the public health care system. People weren't even looking at those, those is, is, issues now. Now the issues of quality are being unearthed. But I would fully agree with my co-panelists that the biggest, one of the biggest problems is that we are not being involved. The big issue that's not being looked at is governance. Why are clinic committees dysfunctional? Why are hospital boards dysfunctional? Well, hospital boards are dysfunctional because that's the place where crooks can get in and control the tenders. So, you know, for example, recently, just as an anecdote, I don't know amount of time, you know, there's no, you can keep going. the district hospital in Ermelo, uh, which is the only hospital in Chet Sabande covering a vast area, and they didn't have any emergency medical service until they built one in Ermelo. But then they built one in Ermelo, but they put it on the second floor, and they put in a lift that's too small to be able to put stretchers inside the lift. <laughs> and that's what happens when you, when, when you have a lack of control and a lack of oversight, particularly from people who are, are users. So, so, so public sector reforms are important. A week ago, Zuma promulgated the Office of Health Standards Compliance. Very important development, an independent institution that is being set up that will prescribe norms and standards for different levels of the healthcare system and which will have an inspectorate that can go in and investigate what is going on and what is the quality of healthcare in, in, in different things. That, that's a revolution if civil society and users of the healthcare system take advantage of it and use it to, to drive demand for health improvement from, from below. But even with these important reforms, one of the problems that we do have as David alluded to, is there are certain things that can't easily be fixed. The human resource crisis, for example. The whole method of calculation. I mean, if you read this NHI pilot things, it's one of the things it says is what we found in the pilot districts was that most of the pilot districts had adequate numbers of nurses. But then you read into the about 15 pages later, and it says the reason why there were adequate number of nurses was because the personal system was changed a year ago to wipe out all non-funded posts so that they no longer reflect in, in, in the system. So it's not that there's an adequate number. It's, a, it's that the, the, the norm has become an in, inadequate number. But there isn't a serious plan on the table to resolve the human resource crisis. And without a, hum, a resolution to the human resource crisis, we can't even begin to talk about national health insurance. I mean, David referred to community healthcare workers there's 70,000 community healthcare workers in South Africa, but they are marginalized, underpaid, unsupervised, earning 1,500 rand a month in most, most instances, and subject to corruption. One of the things we discovered in the Eastern Cape is that they're being paid 1,500 rand, but it appears that if you look at the official records of what they're being paid, that they're being paid 4,500 rand. So what's happening to the, to the 3,000 rand? You know, is somebody filching it off in the system? And that wouldn't be surprising in the Eastern Cape, given the levels of corruption. So there's a lot that has to be done in the public sector, and then there has a lot that has to be done in the private sector. And I want to just quickly finish on this. Private sector reforms are very essential to, to, to the national health system. There's an attack going on at the moment on the very notion of prescribed minimum benefits. And prescribed minimum benefits were introduced in 1998 as a way to try to contain costs and to force medical schemes 
Okay, that's my 20 minutes to, 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 cover, uh, to cover essential conditions. Now prescribed minimum benefits are, are under, uh, under attack. Every attempt to regulate prices by the department has failed, partly because of the, f the, the department's own misguided approach to price control. But the bottom line is that there is no regulation today at all over the costs of specialists, the costs of hospitals, the costs and so on and so on. And, th and that is something that is being fiercely resisted, which is why this question of the healthcare inquiry by the Competition Commission becomes so important. Because if the Competition Commission is able to properly investigate what is going on in the private healthcare sector, it can start to find ways to drive down the prices that can alleviate some of the pressure on the public sector because more people can afford to get into the private sector, even if it's just a temporary means. Now, I know that's anathema, na the notion that more people should get onto the private sector may be anathema to some of us because we think there should be no private sector, but it may be a pragmatic way in the short term, if it's affordable and if it's regulated, to take some of the pressure off the public healthcare sector while the public healthcare sector is finished. But the health inquiry, which is meant to start on the 1st of September this year, is already under attack. There are some people who, some institutions that don't even want the health care inquiry to get beyond its terms of reference. So again, it's something that people who are, have an, an interest in health and justice must pay attention to. So I think I want to conclude by saying, answering the question we were asked to ask, can NHI be achieved? Uh, it, it can be achieved, but it can't be achieved unless there's a movement for the right to health unless people like us insist that Motswaledi and company take seriously our rights to participate in decision-making in relation to health and in the governance of, 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 the, of, of the health system. And, you know, coming back finally to, to the question of the, of, of the middle classes, I think they are an important people to bring, sector to bring into the equation of justice because middle-class people are being ripped off for poor quality health care. But middle class people will only be woken up when poor people start making the suffering that they experience in the public health system visible. And when poor people start saying, well, you know, a few weeks ago everybody jumped up and down about Nelson Mandela and what Nelson Mandela in the 67 minutes, but Nelson Mandela stood for something. And he stood for dignity and he stood for solidarity and social solidarity and cross-class and cross-race solidarity. And so there has to, I think, be some sort of bridgehead into getting that class of people to understand why health is important and why getting a decent and fair healthcare system in South Africa is, is possible. Um, yeah, thanks. Thank you.